Um, so, hello everybody. A very warm welcome to this online seminar on rethinking social networks, qualitative network analysis, conceptual reflexivity and the presentation of the network itself. This event is being organised by the British Sociological Association Social Network Analysis Study Group. So before we start, some general housekeeping. Um, we are recording this uh, presentation. I hope everybody is OK with that. So um, feel free to um, keep your cameras off uh, if you prefer to uh, for the duration of the presentation. Once the presentation has finished, we will stop the recording so that we can have a more relaxed uh, discussion. Um, so um, I would kindly ask you to stay on mute uh, for the duration of the presentation. And after that, as I already mentioned, we'll um, open the discussion for questions and comments. So to ask a question or make a comment, you can either use uh, the raise your hand function, uh, which appears um, kind of sort of in the middle of your screen in the little reactions uh, button. So if you click on that, um, it will give you that option. So um, that kind of gives me an indication that you would like to speak. Um, it would be lovely at that point um, if you could turn your camera on. It'd be lovely to see your faces as well, if you feel comfortable doing so, of course. Alternatively, you can also use the chat function to um, type your question. So I hope that's OK. Um, so um, uh, a very warm welcome again. Um, so unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, Professor Bettina Holstein, who was meant to be a discussant at this event, was not able to join us today. So instead, I have the privilege um, to um, chair today's event. Uh, my name is Selena Genova. I'm an assistant professor in sociology at the University of Nottingham and the research lead for the Migration and Displacement Cluster at the Identities, Citizenship, Equalities and Migration Research Centre at Nottingham. Our distinguished speakers today probably hardly need uh, any introduction as their work has been quite influential in advancing debates within social network analysis, migration studies, sociology and social policy more broadly. But I thought I'd just mention um, a couple of words. So our speakers today are Louise Ryan, uh, who is a senior professor at the London Metropolitan University and the director of the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre. A leading expert in migration studies, Louise is also a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences and has previously served as the vice chair and chair of the British Sociological Association. We also have Alessio D'Angelo, uh, who is a professor of social policy and uh, the co-director of the Center for Applied Social Sciences, Policy Practice and Research at the University of Derby. An interdisciplinary scholar, Alessio is a member of the Executive Committee of the Social Policy Association, also a very uh, active member of uh, the BSA, and together with Louise, they co-convene uh, the BSA Social Network Analysis Study Group. And in the last decade, they have jointly published a trilogy of papers uh, in social networks and in international migration journals. Um, where they have advanced both the conceptualization and the practice of social network analysis. In their individual and joint work, they have explored some of the following questions. How can we research, understand and visualize dynamic personal ties over space and time? And to what extent should we treat network data as network maps as opposed to network narratives? Also, how can we disentangle issues of meaning making or, uh, and interpersonal uh, relationalities behind network data? In inviting us to rethink social network analysis, Louise and Alessio will present their reflexive approach to researching and analyzing network data with a particular focus on qualitative and mixed methods um, and examples informed by migration research and beyond. So, without further ado, over to Alessio and Luis. Wow, thank you very much, Helena. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, humbling introduction there. Uh, and hello, everyone. 
Um, so, as Helena was mentioning, we are here to talk about social network analysis and particularly about um, qualitative network analysis, uh, building on uh, some of the work that Luis and I have been uh, undertaking in the past few years. Um, trying to remember how to move the slides. Here we go. Um, so if you are here, you are probably familiar or at least interested in the concept of social network uh, and in social network analysis, SNA, as a, as a set, as a network in itself of methodologies. And you will be aware that this way of doing research has become uh, increasingly popular within the social sciences in, in general, uh, using different methodological approaches, although it has to be said that the past few decades have been really dominated by uh, quantitative approaches, uh, probably also because of the developments and innovations we've seen in, in IT, big data, and, and online social media, uh, which, which allow to download large scale uh, data sets. Uh, however, at the same time, there's been uh, important advances uh, in qualitative uh, social network analysis, both on its own and very often in the context of, of mixed, method, uh, mixed method research. Um, one thing that has to be observed even in that respect, however, is that even with pieces of research, they are qualitative in, in nature in terms of how the data is collected. Um, the focus tend to be very often on generation of relational data and analysis of relational structures uh, rather than on how the data can be interpreted and analyzed in a more qualitative way. So if you want qualitative research that it's still then influenced by quantitative ways of thinking and summarizing and analyzing the, the information. And to, to, to be clear from the onset, um, we are not here to argue against quantitative uh, social network analysis or quantitative research in general. I mean, I, I, I do my fair share of quantitative uh, analysis myself, uh, but we want to highlight what can be the advantages, but also the challenges of doing social network analysis if you want in a more uh, genuinely uh, qualitative uh, way. So aligning that approach, not just in terms of data collection, but also in, in how we interpret and use uh, and use the data. Um, particularly, as, as Helena was, was mentioning before, uh, Louis and I tend to do most of our work on, on migration. So a lot of our uh, examples and case studies tend to be around uh, migrant social networks and in fact, uh, the area of migration studies as one that has adopted this idea of social networks uh, quite, quite, quite widely. Um, although there's been some criticism in the literature, and I suppose we've contributed to that to, to a certain extent, um, because of how this concept of this word networks has been used, sometimes too much in a generic metaphorical way, um, without necessarily actually engaging uh, with the with the toolkit and with the conceptual toolkit uh, that that comes from uh, social network uh, literature, uh, some of which has its roots in in classic uh, sociological and anthropological research. So there will be the basis there to to work with networks in a in a slightly uh, deeper way that maybe uh, sometime you you see in in some of the in some of the literature. Um, and Louise, myself, often working with other colleagues, they have also tried to highlight the importance of uh, doing mapping exercises and even visualization of social networks, again, in, a, in an aware, in a, in a more kind of methodologically aware manner, if you want. Because also in that case, there is the risk sometimes that the, the the easiness and the appeal of visualizing sociograms can at the same time risk crystallizing networks in a kind of, in a, in a snapshot. And we may end up uh, conflating that image and that snapshot with a full representation of someone's relations. And, and in fact, as we will see, is much more 
uh, complicated than that. So again, our contribution to today and more widely is to help advancing this discussion on proper qualitative approaches to SNA, precisely aligning data collection, data analysis, and really the, the ontological assumptions between, between these things. Um, so for us, it's important that social network research is not just qualitative in how you generate the data, but also in how you interpret the data and then you present the data as part of the research outputs so when you write uh, a paper, for, for example. Um, in this respect, we've got also to probably state that our approach is quite deliberately non-systematic. It's, it's quite deliberately a recognition of research, well, shall we say as a craft more than as a, as a science, uh, but intentionally because there's a recognition there that research is a process, is very often uh, a relational process that requires a high degree of uh, reflexivity and the recognition of the intersubjectivity that uh, underpins processes of meaning, meaning, make, meaning making in the, in, the research, uh, in the research process. So as uh, Elena was mentioning, uh, Louise and I, over the years, we've done, we've done lots of work together, uh, first at the same institution, and then as we've been jumping from one place to the next. Um, and in particular today, we want to focus on what we are calling our trilogy of papers, uh, not a motion picture yet, but maybe to come. Um, so you see the three uh, papers listed here. Uh, from 2018, 2021, and the latest that we published this, this year called Qualitative Analysis of Network Data. Uh, we'll, we'll say a few more things about uh, this paper in, in, in due course, and we can put the links to the three articles uh, in the chat in a, in a moment. Um, we've, we've published other things as well, both, both jointly and independently. You, you see some examples here in the in the slides, um, but to summarize, I think that some of the key contributions we try to make are about uh, again a more serious engagement with the SNA toolkit and the concepts underpinning it, but at the same time not fetishizing the idea of of the network and the, and and its visualization. Uh, we've written and argued for the importance of longitudinal research in mapping networks, particularly migrant networks. Uh, we've published at length about the opportunities of network visualization. Uh, that is something we've done, uh, in particular, working alongside our colleague uh, Paula Tubero, who was a former co-convener of the, of the study group. Um, and we sought to understand networks not as an objective entity to be measured and quantified, as was referred before, but rather to explore how people, first of all, perceive and present their interpersonal interpersonal relations. So at this point, I'll hand it over to Louise. Thanks very much, Alessio. So in terms of the kind of contribution that we've made through our trilogy of papers, one of the key points um, that we really started to make at the beginning of our collaboration was about the importance of dynamism and change over time. Now, we would argue that this is particularly relevant when studying migrants, indeed, when studying everybody, but particularly migrants, because we've observed that very often people publish about migrants' networks in quite a static way, that the migrants may only be interviewed once, and then a particular image or representation of their network is presented at that moment in time. And of course, that may change dramatically as the years go by. And so it is very important for us, particularly as migration scholars, that we understand the dynamics within relationships, how they ebb and flow. So in the beginning of somebody's migration journey, they may rely very much on co-ethnics, for example. So if you are interviewing migrants about their networks at the beginning, when they're newly arrived, you may find a particular configuration of, of their ties. Whereas if you were to follow those people longitudinally over a few years or longer, 
then you may find that their ties had actually changed quite considerably. And this doesn't just apply to their local ties, but of course also to their transnational ties. And, and because we also need to understand how the constitution, the meaning, the strengths or the weaknesses of those ties, both locally and transnationally, evolve through the life course as people age, for example, as they have children, as the years pass by. So all of these things are really important. And it very much emphasizes that we should avoid simply crystallizing a particular representation of people's networks at a fixed moment in time. We all know, if we think about our own personal networks, how much our relationships ebb and flow over time. And of course, the same also applies to research participants. So this then raises important methodological, but also ethical questions about how can we understand relational dynamics and the ways in which they are perceived, but also how they are presented in research encounters. Next slide, please. So this then brought Alessio and I to our next paper in the trilogy, which was the presentation of the network itself. And I think this was a really important paper for us. And I should say quite honestly, that it was a paper that took us many years to write. And I think we presented it at numerous conferences, including at the BSA conference, before we finally got it to the stage where we were happy with it. And we were very pleased that it was published in the journal Social Networks, which is probably considered you know, the key journal in the field. And, and it's, it's a journal that doesn't usually publish a lot of qualitative papers. So we were very happy to get this paper published in that journal, particularly. And so what we were doing in this article, the presentation of the network itself, was we were drawing on some of that classic theory that Alessio mentioned earlier, people like Goffman, but also Crackhard and others. And we wanted to offer our critical insights into the processes through which networks are co-constructed within research encounters between the interviewers and the interviewees to really understand the active agency that's going on in that encounter. And so we applied a very reflexive lens in terms of our own research experiences in that paper to argue that, that there's a crucial step in between the way in which participants perceive their networks in the privacy of their own minds, and then the way in which those networks may be represented in a final output from the researchers. What's going on? What are the layers what is the interpretation? What's the meaning making that's going on in that process? So if we think about, for example, the ways in which participants may present their ties, very few participants will admit that they're very unpopular and they have no friends. Very few participants will admit that actually they don't get on with any of their relatives and all of those relationships are broken down. So when people are presenting their ties, there is a presentation of self underpinning that, that we as researchers need to be very sensitive to. And we need to be looking at the dynamics of that process in how particularly when the network is being visualized, especially when the network is being visualized by the participants in the research encounter, for example, when you're using a sociogram or, or when you're using any research tool like a name generator or any of those tools, that that will then perhaps impact upon how the participant presents their social ties to you as a researcher. So that's that the paper, the presentation of the network self. And, and really these are all stepping stones to our new paper because it's all a kind of an incremental process. So this brings us on to the new paper, which is about revealing the magic trick. Again, this was a paper that Alessio and I spent a long time talking about Endless Cups of Coffee went into the co-authoring of these papers. They're very collaborative and we spend a lot of time talking and thinking uh, before we actually start to write anything about these papers. So this particular paper, which is called Qualitative Analysis of Migrants Network Data, using conceptual reflexivity to reveal the magic trick. And we really liked that analogy of the magic trick because there's often a sort of a sense in which there's a lot going on behind the curtain 
in social science research, particularly perhaps in qualitative social science research, that you can describe in great detail how you collected the data or generated or gathered the data. And then there's a very short bit about how the data were analyzed. And then it's like, da da, and here are the findings. And really what we were very curious about is what is that process in the middle between the design of the project, the recruitment of the participants, the collecting of the data, and then ta-da, here are the findings. So we realize, of course, that magicians are often advised not to reveal the secrets of their trick, because once they reveal the secret, it kind of demystifies the whole thing. And you sort of go, oh, is that how they did it? It doesn't sound quite so magical anymore. But we think the same applies a bit to social science researchers, because it is about really revealing a process that can be quite messy and that can be quite complicated and quite nuanced um, and, and can be quite difficult to explain, actually. And that might be part of the reason why it is so rarely explained in detail. But we feel that it is ethically, epistemologically and methodologically crucial that we do begin to open up that magic box to explain the process that goes on. Thank you, Alessio. So it is about looking behind the curtain. Now, in many SNA research publications, as I've said, the methods are often explained in detail, often in a highly technical way, quite a procedural way. There's often a kind of a formulaic approach to how we describe what we do as researchers. You almost feel there's a bit of a tick box going on. First I did this, then I did that, then this happened, and then ta-da, the findings occurred. And it's often the case that there is more detail given about the process of collecting the data than there is about the analysis of the data. Authors may report, for example, that the data were cleaned, that the data were entered into a software package like Envivo for coding, that particular um, that there was a particular mapping of a coding tree that nodes were developed and agreed upon and ties were, were produced or grandparent nodes or child nodes. So it all appears quite formulaic and procedural. In a narrative-based research, the most relevant quotes are then said to have been selected and the findings to emerge, which can all sound, again, a bit magical. Now, of course, this approach which really simplifies and truncates all of those messy, complicated procedures, we understand that in most journal articles, which are 8,000 words, it can be almost impossible to explain and do justice to that complex, messy, nuanced process. So we do understand, and we're guilty of this ourselves, that that process is often explained very briefly, maybe in just a paragraph or two. But what is happening, therefore, is that all of those layers of interpretation remain obscure. And there's little acknowledgement in those published papers of the messiness or what we might call the craft of meaning making that underpins that analytical process. Thanks, Alessio. And so this brings us to what we are presenting in the article, in our latest article, is this idea of conceptual reflexivity. And we're calling for researchers to embrace conceptual reflexivity. Now, of course, we're all very familiar with reflexivity in the sense of a more identity-based reflexivity, to be aware of you, your gender, your ethnicity, your class, your age, and how all of that might impact on the research process and on your engagement with participants. We're all familiar with that kind of reflexivity, and that's increasingly used in research. We mean something a bit extra beyond that. We're talking about being reflexive about your sort of conceptual toolkit. So being reflexive about your methodology, your epistemological traditions, your knowledge of the literature. What kinds of literature are you using? What's informing your thinking and your meaning making? What techniques, what training have you had that has enabled you to find certain things in the data or to approach the data in a particular kind of way. So that in other words, we're acknowledging that we're not coming to this in any sort of neutral way, but we're coming to it with a lot of baggage, including 
that epistemological baggage that we bring to the analytical process. And by exploring the intersubjectivity of underpinning that meaning making, we aim to offer insights into the craft of qualitative SNA, and at the same time, bring to the foreground the ethical and epistemological issues. And so in the article, which we can only very briefly describe now, but you can read at your leisure, we present two case studies. So to illustrate what we're talking about in terms of really digging deeply into the analytical process of the data. So I'm now quickly going to present one example and then I'll hand over to Alessio to present his. So in the paper, I talk about my uh, interview, my research encounter with Dominic. So this was based on one of my Polish projects. I've done a lot of research with Polish migrants over the years. So Dominic was a participant who came to London in 2004, immediately after EU enlargement when Poland joined the uh, European Union. So he arrived in London in 2004 with his girlfriend. At that point, he spoke no English at all. And in the, in the narrative that he shared with me in the interview, he really offered a very linear approach of how he arrived in London, speaking no English. He then got a job, which was very casual, cash in hand, working on a market stall. And he found this job through another Polish person. So very much he was relying for accommodation and employment on co-ethnics. And then after a few years, he developed more confidence in his English language. He was able to develop more UK based work experience and he was able to demonstrate the skills that he would brought with him from Poland. And he then applied for a job which was formally advertised. He was interviewed and he was recruited through human resources in a very transparent equal opportunity process, very formal. And he got a job working in a, a more managerial position. So now here's the reflexivity. Here's me entering the story now. So I was sitting there listening to Dominic. And to be honest, I was feeling a bit disappointed because this was so textbook. This was so typical of a migrant arrives dependent on bonding ties of co-ethnics. Then after a while, time goes by, his networks change and he's now able to find a job in a completely different way. And he no longer relies on networks. And I thought, yeah, but that's not very innovative. There's nothing there that's particularly new. And so, you know, I was probing, I was hoping that I might find something a bit more interesting. And so as the interview went on, I was really attuned and listening to see, was there anything else in the story that might offer a fresh and new insight? You have a little picture there of the sociogram. There's more about that in the paper. Next slide, please, Alessio. So then here comes a bit of the magic trick. Because Dominic kept talking, so he got this job through a formal recruitment process, but he didn't stay in that job. And then he started to tell me the story and my ears pricked up because the story was about how he went to a party and how he met a boss, a man, a manager who owned a company at the party. And then he kind of built up a bit of a rapport with this man. And the end of the story was this guy offered him a job. Well, you can imagine my surprise because this was Granovator's classic weak tie in action. I was absolutely delighted with this because it really complicated that trajectory of Dominic's networks that he started off with the co-ethnics. OK, we know that. Then he moved into formal recruitment, no reliance on networks at all. That could have been the end of the story, but it wasn't because there was a third stage of the story where he then got a job, a promotion through a weak tie. And so I was really interested in this because it enabled me to push my own analysis of migrants, networks and ties and how they evolve over time. And this was really the, the clue that led to my innovative thinking in a paper I published in 2011, which has become one of my most highly cited papers about weak ties and about the, the, the vertical and horizontal nature of weak ties. And all of that idea, that spark came through that conversation with Dominic. So in the article, I really show that, I try to show what went on behind the curtain to reveal the magic trick of how I went from this data to this insight, this analysis, this theory, and 
what influenced me in coming to that insight. It didn't just happen out of thin air. It was drawing on my knowledge of the literature, on my sensitivity, the fact that I was tuning in, looking for these examples and how the findings, ta-da, were very much not out of the blue, but were very much embedded in my own kind of conceptual epistemological framing and trying to reveal and make that process explicit. So I'll hand over to Alessio now, who'll tell you about his example, which is again discussed in the paper. Thanks, Alessio. Thank you, Louise. Uh, so yes, the second example we present on in the paper is from a project I was working on with, with other colleagues uh, from Middlesex University back at the time. Um, and it was a large scale multi-method project on uh, migration across the Mediterranean. This was in the context of the so-called um, refugee crisis. I mean, I've published in other places more details uh, about that particular study, if, if anyone is, is interested. But in, in our joint paper, uh, like Louise does with her Polish study, I, I'm focusing on one interview in particular, and that is an interview with a young man um, originally from Ivory Coast uh, that, that mm, as a pseudonym, I'm calling David. Now, one of the aims of the project was to investigate these, these journeys from Sub-Saharan Africa uh, to Southern Europe, uh, Sicily in this particular case. And so we did um, in-depth interviews with a large number of participants try to understand uh, what were the uh, drivers of these journeys, but also trying to understand uh, some details about key locations, uh, timings of the journeys and so on and, and so forth. And when I started reading the transcript from, from David's uh, interview, um, I'm, I must confess I was slightly disappointed because uh, I, I wasn't really finding the sort of information we, we were looking for. I mean, we, we wanted all these details about, again, the, the, the journey and the process and the, and the, and the routes and, and again, times and locations. And, and, and there wasn't an awful lot uh, about that. There was, there was a lot of anecdotal, very personal information, but nothing that could help me to understand um, the wider picture. And and then, as you as you know, you start reading several interviews, uh, cross cross checking the information, trying to read them in as part of the wider context. And I remember at one point quite vividly, a bit of a eureka moment where I realized that I was really looking for the wrong information, or rather, I was reading the transcript from the wrong angle, and I realized that this. Um, journeys through Africa weren't so much described and recalled by the participants in the terms I was thinking about them, in terms of geographical coordinates and travel times and so on. Rather, they were consistently presented as a succession of personal encounters. So the refugee journey wasn't about, I, I departed from this place on that date, and then I went straight to this other location. And then I spent so many months here and, and so on and so forth. It was all about people you knew, people you met, people you bumped into. There are some nice, I think, quotes in the paper where, whereby, again, David described his journey in terms of, well, I had a, had a discussion with my mother about the fact that I wanted to leave the village. And my mother told me, oh, well, go to the next village. And there's an old friend of mine that you may not remember, but she will remember you. Go and talk to her because I know she's in touch with other people that very often help help young, young men like you to travel further north to other towns where you may find a job. And so, you know, this David, David goes there, meets this person. And then while he's, he's in this other village, he meets another person and they decide to go and together to another to another town. And then pretty casually, they bump into somebody who offers a part time job for a short period of time. So they decided to stay there. But then the job opportunity takes them to another place again and so on and so forth. OK, so it's one encounter after the other. Some of these encounters are with people known from before, family networks, personal networks. 
some come across as pretty serendipitous, pretty casual, and there's lots of these encounters whose importance is very often revealed also or only in retrospect. So you start hearing the story and it's like, oh, okay, this, this meeting sounds really crucial. This person is talking to me about this is really important in the journey. And then you realize, no, actually not, not so much. And this other contact who sounded a bit, a bit random, you know, somebody bumping into, into a cafe becomes really crucial and fundamental in driving migration decision for the for the following for the following few months but that is something you understand only afterwards because clearly these were interviews that were done at the point of well what we will call arrival uh in um, in uh, in sicily um so first of all going back to this discussion about conceptual reflexivity <clears throat> Social network analysis, actually, in this particular study I was part of, wasn't really a key concept or key part of the methodology. It was more kind of, if you want, traditional, uh, in-depth, qualitative interviews. But the idea of networks and networking really emerged quite naturally as a very effective way of analyzing the transcripts, of, of understanding the true meaning of the information that we, we were told. Although at the same time, at the very moment I say this, I've got to acknowledge that I am calling this process as inductive. You know, some people would, would, would maybe use even terms such as kind of grounded theory. I went there with no ideas and, and this idea of networks emerge from the data naturally. Well, yes, but naturally to me, naturally to somebody who's really embedded in network research, who's been publishing a lot on this concept, and so somebody like me who's really geared into seeing networks every, everywhere I look. So to what extent can I actually objectively claim that the, the idea of networks was emerging naturally? Well, it's, it's, it's up for debates, if nothing else. Um, but nonetheless, I will argue that that, that, that that was an important, again, eureka moment, kind of epiphany really, in the process of analyzing the data. The, the moment I started seeing the networks and understanding the data and the stories from that perspective, I really was able to, I think, add new understandings to that large scale migration phenomena on, on which there was quite a lot of research and media coverage at the, at the time. I mean, in fact, something else I, uh, reflecting on when I was analyzing that that very uh, interview was the fact that um, migration processes during the refugee crisis were very often described through networks like that that picture you see here on the on the slide uh, networks in the sense of movement networks connections of of, of routes um, which are visualized in that way but they are really described as if those lines on the map are kind of pipelines through which hundreds of thousands of people are just pushed through in large scale migration flows. You know, there's very often this, this narrative of, of flows, which is a very macro approach to certainly refugee studies in particular, where you tend to focus on the macro dimension and you start losing track of the more micro individual dimension of the personal experience and also the relational dimension of individual migrants. And so for me, all of a sudden, those maps weren't representing the same thing anymore. Those maps made, made me think about the fact that actually each and every individual account of each and every individual migrant could be understood as a sociogram on the move, as a network then moves over space and time because people were constantly changing, using, deconstructing and reconstructing their networks on the go. The social network of, of a migrant when, when started from some Saharan Africa wasn't the same at the point that they had reached Libya and wasn't the same at the point they have reached uh, Europe. And it's not because how because of some of the literature tends to tends to suggest, you know, refugees drop all their networks behind them 
and then they travel and then they end up in Europe and then they start from scratch laboriously recreating networks. Now the networks are what make the journey happen and the networks change over space and over time and are in fact in many cases the means through which the journey is, is undertaken. Um, so in, in, in some other papers I've published, that's something you, you may want to look up, which is called the, the Network Refugee, which is, which is a paper where I discuss these things a bit more in detail. I mean, I, I, I try to argue on how this network approach to migrant journeys can actually help us challenge many of the assumptions that even underpin policy making and policy responses to phenomena such the refugee crisis and so much is missed in policy making because this network dimension is is lost um but again everything here stems from my thinking networks position okay uh so there's a recognition on my part of the fact that what i'm reading i'm reading it through my network spectacles through my network mind and that takes us back to this idea of conceptual reflexivity if you want conceptual positioning that is true for both the examples we Louise and I have, have presented you with and we would argue it's true for most social network analysis research probably uh, beyond social network analysis uh, research as as well so in our paper, we really highlight the importance of being reflective with regard to the epistemological traditions, the academic literature we engage with, even the training we've, we've undertaken, all of those things, how do they affect our interpretation and our analysis of, of the data? And in being reflective, we mean what, well, we hope we gave you some examples of being actually able to recount how we encountered the data and what was our reaction to the data and what we thought when we first saw the data and how we acted upon what we were reading into, into the data. Um, and in doing that, we recognize that data emerges as a dialogical process. Data emerges through interviews, for example, as an interaction between us and the participants, which is something that maybe sometimes we tend to forget, even in even in qualitative research. It's not it's not the data being collected down there, and we are collecting the data. The data is precisely a presentation of information, what we are calling the presentation of the network self in this context, through the interaction between the researcher and the research. And we would argue even more that this is something that happens both during a live interview and even later when we sit at our desk reading the transcript, we are still engaging, we are still engaging in a relational, in a process, in a relationship with the data, with the story, with the person recalling that, that, particular, that particular story. I mean, and, and we think it's quite important to say that in the context of, of social network uh, research, because obviously social network analysis is, is, is the epitome of relational sociology, is about recognizing the fundamental importance of human relations. And, and obviously this emphasis on relationality must include a recognition of the relationship between the researchers and, and the participants. Um, now, I suppose the, the risk or the counter argument that could be, could be raised uh, in response to all of this is that the approach we are, we are talking about comes across as pretty messy and, and eminently, if you want, personal and subjective. But, but that, that is what qualitative research is about and should be about, isn't it? So. We are not, of course, arguing for data relativism, and, and we are aware of the risk of going too further down this line and, and, and kind of suggesting, oh, well, then it's, it's just whatever you want to see in the data. It's, it's not about that. If you want this, it's kind, of, it's kind of the opposite. It's about being very open, very transparent, very reflective about the process that generates meaning in the data or that 
transforms an interview into data and into findings. And again, this is the opposite of data relativism because this is linked to our responsibility among the other things of giving voice to the participants, presenting and interpreting meaning, not imposing meaning, but presenting meaning while acknowledging the process we go through generating or attempting to generate meaning and an account of individual of individual stories. Um, so that is, I suppose, what we mean by revealing the magic trick, uh, revealing what happens behind the scenes. And as we said before, we, we, we obviously you cannot do that with this level of detail in every single paper. And quite understandably, there are some journal articles where you want to focus more on the actual results and on the actual findings and on the actual topics. You want to make a point about what is happening without getting lost in a conversation about reflexivity and methodology. But I think we should also find spaces uh, to have that discussion about methods and about being reflective about methodological approaches. And I think that it's something we should acknowledge in all our research, that that conceptual reflexivity is something that is important to recognize everywhere. And as again, Luis was suggesting before, very often the standard practice of academia, even in sociological, even in, in qualitative research, tends to prevent us from discussing that at length or even to be a bit reticent about that because anything which sounds like messiness or personal approach to the data, it, it, it sounds not professional enough. Should we say anything of that or should we hide it again behind the curtain? And, and no, we, we are arguing for having those, having those conversations, having open fora for discussing in nothing else these sort of things within within our our research communities and and exchanging our thoughts about data generation meaning generation presentation of the self and uh, and conceptual reflexivity so we hope that events like these can be uh, a step in that direction and part of that part of that process um okay i think we can wrap it up here in terms of the formal presentation i'm sharing this final slide with some references if people want to take note and maybe actually one final slide to remember everyone that we are doing this event as part of the work of the social network analysis study group snag at the at the bsa and if you want to find out more about the study group there's the website there and there's a link to our mailing list on the slide as well thank you uh, thank you so much for uh, this thought-provoking presentation, Alessio and Luis, really, really quite rich um, and lots to think about. Um, so if I may briefly abuse my powers as chair and just kind of share uh, some brief thoughts. Um, I think your work is, is really important uh, because it kind of, it made me really think about how can we how can we really study um you know social networks and social relations and it works really important because it kind of draws attention to um the temporal dynamism in migrant or in general in social relations um and also it kind of um, highlights uh, the performative aspect of research encounters as well and also how that affects uh, the network but more broadly um i thought your caution against the um, fetishization of the network itself was quite important and that kind of kind of thinking about this and particularly you mentioned uh, in your presentation the work of goffman and how you know his dramaturgical approach how we're all actors performing on a stage and we've got different masks that we put on and, you know, obviously in, in his case, kind of he talked about identity and, you know, raised the question whether there is such a thing as, you know, true identity and whether we can get to the bottom of that. So that got me thinking uh, about whether, you know, we can ever capture true network, you know, uh, true social relations because of all the issues you mentioned that we need to be mindful of, uh, such as the fact that, you know, um, obviously they change over time, 
and in uh, in the life course and there's a performative element and so on and so forth. So really, really kind of challenging. But I also think your work really offers a very important contribution, not just to um, social network research, but um, to qualitative research in the social sciences more broadly. And as you rightly observe, um, far too often, you know, in an attempt to provide a rigorous account of uh, the research process, um, you know, we find scholars kind of oscillate between either adopting a more prescriptive and I'll go a bit far in some ways, like very positivistic um, accounts of, um, you know, of data collection. So I feel that even after all these years, I know this is a, a very old debate, you know, what counts as a scientific uh, approach. But I think I find that after all these years, you know, in qualitative research, we tend to see this tendency to kind of mirror these very kind of prescribed ways or set ways in which we also report the way in which we generate or collect uh, data. Or we kind of observe the opposite, as you as you pointed out, um, where people uh, leave the analysis stage kind of really enveloped in mystery. Um, and I think being more transparent and indeed reflexively engaging with the process of sense making is quite crucial to provide more providing more accurate representations of the social realities that we study. And listening to your presentation actually uh, reminded me of something. Uh, so back in 2012, Melissa Grebner and colleagues argued that working with qualitative data is a bit like, sorry to bring in another metaphor, but is a bit like cooking without a recipe. You know, people throwing in various things and, you know, as you say, there's a magic trick, ta-da, you know, there's this, you know, wonderful thing that we get at the end. Um, but at the same time, obviously, you know, we should avoid an approach where anything goes. Um, um, because we often, you know, um, we then fall victim to, you know, the, again, positivist accusation of lack of rigor. And also Mears and Cochrane in, uh, in 2019 kind of argued um, that you know doing qualitative research is an art and a craft but a craft that can be learned so i think your idea of uh, particularly conceptual reflexivity um alongside with how it works in practice is really useful in helping us learn the craft and i think kind of sharing these reflexive accounts is quite important and it also more broadly i think um, your work relates uh, to uh, the kind of the so-called reflexive turn in migration studies. You know, currently the the field is um, undergoing a, a process of uh, decentering, kind of rethinking the uh, contours of the disciplines, the categories we use, and also the kind of the methods and approaches and perspectives that we use in migration research. So I think it it has um, uh, kind of chimes really well with those uh, debates. And as I was uh, listening to you, I was kind of, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions uh, because um, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I don't know the audience, but I'm guessing that there might be a mixture of kind of more experienced scholars, maybe others who are um, kind of early career academics, um, uh, PhD researchers. And obviously, sometimes when we do research projects, we, you know, sometimes we work as part of a team, sometimes we kind of do a small uh, project on our own. So I was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit more about um, the differences in practicing conceptual reflexivity when you're doing or working individually, and also um, when you're working as part of a what like a bigger research team, and what the challenges are. What do you see as, as the challenges? Um, and also another thing, if I can add. Um, this is kind of a slightly different question, but another thing that really struck me in your presentation uh, was um, when you were reflecting on the processes of meaning making, it was actually the presence of emotions. So you kind of talked about, you know, um, feelings of frustration and excitement and, you know, at times disappointment. Um, so, I was kind of wondering what the roles of emotions in that process of meaning making is and 
I suppose to be completely transparent, um, you know, the reason why I'm thinking of probably, you know, um, it's a little bit like what Alessia talked about, you know, I think networks and I see networks. So I've been uh, working recently with one of my former colleagues um, and thinking about uh, Elisabetta Zuntina, we've been thinking about research and motion and how that features um, in, in the process of of kind of uh, meaning making and producing knowledge. Um, so we kind of, we published last year paper in ethnic and racial studies uh, on that. But I was wondering, you know, is there space for emotional reflexivity within conceptual reflexivity? Um, and are there any sets of questions that we could be asking ourselves? I know there isn't a recipe, but I just wondered whether you could uh, reflect a bit more on that. Elena, before we start answering, can I clarify, are we turning off the recording now or are we recording this bit before we open up to audience questions? Very happy to stop it or continue to record up to you entirely. What do you think, Alessio? Should we maybe just capture this and then turn it off? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So maybe I'll just start with, with maybe your second question about emotions. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very aware that in migration studies at the moment, and it was a big theme at the UNESCO conference on migration uh, in the summer, there was a big um, move towards reflexivity. But in fact, that's not new. Uh, there's been, people have been writing about reflexivity for more than 20 years. And some of us were publishing about reflexivity close to 20 years ago. So it is a little bit annoying that some people who seem to have recently discovered reflexivity are now making a big song and dance about it. I mean, it's great that reflexivity is being taken seriously, but I think sometimes there's a tendency to kind of reinvent the wheel and maybe not always acknowledge that people were publishing about reflexivity many, many years ago. And similarly about emotions and the role of emotions. And I think particularly feminist scholars were writing about emotions more than 20 years ago. And it's important that we don't reinvent the wheel and then kind of negate the work that earlier scholars have done. So I think emotions are absolutely crucial. And I'll just share a very brief anecdote, but I don't want to talk too long because I'm very keen to open up to the audience. But I, one of the first projects I ever worked on as a professional researcher was when I was a research fellow on a project on mental health and migration. And it was a quantitative study. Actually, one of my first big projects was a quantitative study. And we were using very much a tick box questionnaire, which was so difficult because people wanted to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of ticking boxes, you know, how do you have suicidal ideation, really brutal questions and tick, tick, tick. And people started to talk. People started to tell you their stories. And a questionnaire really wasn't capturing the depth of what people wanted to share. And I remember saying to my line manager at the time that I would love to write a paper about the emotional aspect of doing this research and really having a very reflexive paper about this project. And this was over 20 years ago. And he was horrified because he was a clinician. He was quite a hardcore, quantitative, statistical researcher. And he was actually very worried that if I published a paper, which I subsequently did with, with the other research assistant, that it would undermine the validity of the research if we started talking about messy emotions. But we persevered and he agreed only as long as we were able to publish the standard findings paper in a proper scientific journal alongside the paper that we then subsequently authored on the emotional aspect of the research. And so I think there's always been that tension about revealing the emotions, that it can be perceived as undermining the rigor the validity, the objectivity of the research. But I would actually argue the contrary. I would say that being reflexive about all of that messiness that went on behind the scenes is crucial. And in fact, it adds to the rigor of the research. So I'm all for transparency, but I'll stop talking now and I'll hand over to Alessio to answer maybe your first question. Yes, very briefly, just on the first question about different ways to be reflexive, whether as part of a team or as part of, or, or, or doing that individually. I mean, I, I, I don't know in the sense, I don't have any any simple one-liner to, to answer that. I think it, it, it depends a lot, but, but if, 
I, I would say that what is interesting about this paper we were presenting, for example, is that it brings together two separate projects that Louise and, and I did separately. We, Louise wasn't involved in my in my Mediterranean study and I was not involved in her Polish study. And we were all doing it as part of wider pieces of work. And in my case, it was even an, an international team and so on. And, and I think it can actually be very useful after a project, after a formal externally funded project has been wrapped up and you've done the report and you've done the more formal outputs to step out of it and discuss it with someone else who was not involved in that in the first place, because that's where maybe some of the more original ideas can come or the more interesting approaches can 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 emerge. And 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 there's that issue of time though. I mean, there's this issue of temporality that applies to the research we do, as well as to us being reflective on our own research. You know, I mean, I'm I'm now realizing things about my PhD that, that I wasn't realizing at the time. And I'm like, oh wow, that's interesting. Why didn't I write a, a chapter about that back then? Because you are looking at things after after some time and in a different context and by exchanging your views with with someone else um but it's a bit of a luxury as well in in the way in which academia operates because because the idea is that you get a project you do the field work you do the outputs that you put in the proposal get them out of the way get another project start with another set of outputs so what again i feel privileged that we managed to do this one paper and i hope we'll manage to do more but there's got to be a recognition that then requires the time of thinking back, of doing or having this conversation outside what is normally the normal framework of funded research. So it, it's about really being determined to find the time and space to have these conversations that then enable you to be reflective in a, in a certain way. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate this. Okay, at this point, I will stop the recording and I'll um, open the floor uh, for discussions.